Hello. 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 Hello, everyone. How about now? Oh, there we go. OK, so um, hello. Welcome to uh, another installment of Art 107. Um, today, I am going to kind of get you started with uh, sort of making something in Rhino. We're going to kind of go from the sort of setup stuff that we worked on uh, at the end of class on Tuesday. And we're going to uh, actually, uh, you know, use some of these objects to make uh, sort of larger objects. So um, as promised, I was uh, going to bring up a project of uh, my own to show you um, for every sort of, uh, you know, uh, Rhino session that we do. Um, and this is actually kind of a, an um, interesting project. So I went to the Harvard Museum of Contemporary Zoology. Um, back probably like eight years ago. Um, and uh, they have an intact uh, dodo skeleton. Um, so I was able to work with the uh, archivists there to 3D scan it. Um, and we used a sort of like medical grade um, light scanner. You can see that, um, you know, it's really messy, right? Um, so uh, 3D scanning has gotten a little bit better in the intervening eight years, but to be honest, um, not, not really that much better. Um, what you get sometimes with contemporary 3D scans where maybe they're made from a photo or they're using, um, you know, photo apps on your phone is you get something that has a lot more kind of averaging. So one of the reasons why it actually looks kind of chunky um, is because we were going for precision. Um, so we wanted uh, you know, this kind of uh, geometry to be as accurate as possible. And I wasn't as concerned with forming like a, a solid shell. So those are sort of fragments from the scanning process that I can choose to use or not use. Um, and so I went from that to basically uh, making something that could be made in wood. Um, and so I took those scanned objects and then sectioned them and then uh, made these, you know, technically modular forms in Rhino. Um, and then over here is actually uh, a template that I made to cut them out on the laser cutter. So this is what all those shapes look like kind of laid out um, for the laser cutter. There are some Autodesk apps that do this process kind of more streamlined. This was back in the bad old days when you had to actually do it yourself. Um, but now uh, Autodesk has a tool called uh, Recap 360 um, that actually uh, makes a lot of this way easier. Um, and so then you can see um, I made it into a real thing. Um, so I just did the bottom part of the skeleton. Um, but there it is. Dun, dun, dun. So um, super, super tedious, I will say that about this project. Um, but it came together, and it, uh, it lived to go to many places. So no, I do not need that. So getting started in Rhino, there's a couple of things on the course website that I wanted to point out to you. Um, one thing is that uh, we have this Rhino sort of mini assignment coming along. And what this assignment is designed to do is this assignment is designed to kind of familiarize yourself with the Rhino environment and also kind of get through some of the sort of basic stumbling blocks of technique before we go on to work on an assignment that is maybe a little bit more idea driven. So. What you're being asked to do in this assignment is to uh, can use 100 repetitions of a module. And that module could be pretty much anything. It could be uh, anything from the solid menu would be a good candidate. Or um, you know, if you want to kind of go beyond, uh, it could literally be anything. Um, so um, we're going to look at these tools in lecture uh, today, obviously. Um, there's some inspiration uh, kind of uh, models that I went ahead and made and uploaded for you, just kind of illustrating the different approaches you can take. You can take a look at those at your leisure. Um, one other thing that I would consider looking at, once my, uh, 
Yes, thank you, web browser. Um, so the other thing I would consider looking at is some, uh, I put up s this morning, I put up some examples from last semester. So in this assignment, um, you are encouraged to work in either an abstract or a sort of pictorial uh, way. So you can see here's an abstract solution to the assignment. Here's a very sort of representational pictorial solution. Um, this one I just thought was kind of lovely. Um, again, more abstract, but certainly fulfills the assignment. Um, again, this one is extremely pictorial. I would say it's actually sort of like 2D in 3D, which I thought was just kind of funny um, and creative. Um, please tell me that you know what the Tetris is. OK, thank God. I, I lost like a quarter of my life to Tetris. It would be sad if people didn't know what it was. So um, yeah, so another, another sort of more abstract solution. Um, and then I finish off with like a super sort of pictorial solution. And the other thing that I think is interesting about this particular solution is that they did, they sort of pushed the, the idea of what is a module, right? That a module doesn't necessarily have to be a block, although a block is a per perfectly reasonable uh, thing to use. Um, so I think they got a whole different kind of quality by using uh, this rounded object. Um, and then of course the sort of, um, whoever completed this assignment really um, uh, took the time to sort of like think about the positioning of these objects and the details, which is really compelling. Like these little, you know, bent hands. Um, so this, this would be sort of like probably my A++ um, and then all of these assignments are probably B plus assignments or more. Um, so yeah, just to give you an idea. Okay, so um, I know we started a little bit uh, with Rhino last class, but we're gonna go ahead and uh, get going on it again. Um, I'm not sure if I was feeling 100% well on Tuesday. So I'm hoping that we can be uh, a little bit more kind of on it today. How's everybody doing, by the way? Got a big weekend coming up? Yeah, yeah. It's just pretty crappy weather. It's hard to get excited about um, hard to get excited about spring. So okay, so we're coming into our sort of four port viewport here, and we're basically going to go ahead and get started making stuff. I think that at this point in your travels with Rhino, you probably do not need this uh, right viewport or right sidebar. Um, we will certainly be using the heck out of it uh, in just a couple of sessions, but for now, I think we're just gonna get rid of it. Um, we may activate it later this class. Um, then again, we may not. So. A couple of other quick notes um, for this demo, if you're watching it kind of out of sequence, um, for some reason. <laughs> um, if you're watching this demo out of sequence, um, we are also not using units. Um, so we're not doing the, the thing, which I'll be showing you how to do very quickly, where we go into um, the uh, properties uh, and preferences of the file settings um, to set your units, whether it's inches or centimeters. We're going to just take a sort of the units for whatever they are right now and pretend that it doesn't matter. Um, why does it not matter? Um, because in this case, we're just generating, we're making something that we want to pretty much look at on the screen. It's gonna live its whole life in Rhino. We're not gonna be you know, using it to like hold up our house or you know, fit into a part in our car. So, um, so it really doesn't matter if it's in inches or centimeters. We can just say it's w one unit or 10 units or 100 units or whatever. So it's an important distinction um, for us right now. So what we're gonna do first is we're going to go ahead and just generate a couple of uh, solids. And so right now for this demo and for this assignment, we're gonna be working mostly in the solid, um, in the sort of solid realm. So solids are just quickly defined, solids are what? It's kind of a common sense definition. 
Um, a solid is, in Rhino, a solid is an object that has no gaps and it has volume. So is the, I'm gonna make a box real quickly. So I'm just gonna click on this box and I'll just make it, you know, one large unit. So that's four little units. Um, again, I'm using, uh, just as a review from yesterday, I might talk about some of the interface stuff. I'm using the double, uh, double finger pinch to zoom in and out on these viewports. And here I can click based on this prompt uh, coming up for height. Go ahead and click there. So this form right now is a solid. And uh, also, uh, don't forget, uh, last class we talked about the viewport settings. And so right now we're in a situation where we have all wireframe uh, viewports. Uh, personally, I like to keep the uh, perspective viewport uh, in maybe like a ghosted mode. Um, and the reason uh, I talked about that last class, the reason that the ghosted mode is kind of optimal, at least for me and probably most other people, uh, is because it allows you to see what's inside the object or what's behind the object, but it also allows you to have some notion that there is an actual face here. So this solid that we're looking at right now, I'm just using two fingers uh, in the perspective view to orbit. This solid is completely well. It's solid. How do we know it's solid? Um, well, because there are no gaps. We made it out of the solid menu, which is another good clue <laughs> that it's probably a solid. Um, and if I just quickly apply this uh, function called the explode function to it, um, you can see that this object right now is what's called a poly surface. So I took the solid and I just exploded it and I broke it up into a poly surface. So what's the difference between a poly surface and a solid? Very little. Um, a poly surface is inherently a, so a, a, excuse me, a solid is always a poly surface. A poly surface is not always a solid. Allow me to illustrate. <laughs> so, okay, so this is right now a poly surface and a solid, meaning that it's a bunch of different surfaces that uh, combine to form a closed shape. If we violate the sort of closedness of the solid, we have now made it uh, what Rhino calls an open polysurface. Um, so it's no longer closed, it's open. And, but it is still an, uh, a perfectly cromulent polysurface. Cromulent is not a real word, by the way. Um, I was going to say perfectly reasonable polysurface. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, so those are just some things to think about in general about solids. We're going to talk uh, probably several times over the next couple weeks about what makes a solid and what you could do with solids. Why am I even going on and on about solids? Um, it might be because they're actually kind of important in Rhino. So when something is a solid, it opens you up to like a whole other world of tools in Rhino. And if it's not a solid, then you can't do any of that stuff. So um, whether something's a solid or not will become important really later. So in any case, we're just gonna go ahead and make a regular box. Um, we'll do it again, follow these prompts, and then go up here for height. And so now we have our wonderful box. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, could I just like make another box? Sure, you could. Um, it would be faster to just uh, cut and paste it. And so if you cut and paste in Rhino, it will cut and paste on the exact same spot. Um, is there a way to get around that? Not really. Um, let me go ahead and paste another one. So we've got this one uh, over here. And you may notice there's a couple of things happening. Now, I've got more than one square or more than one block, right? That's nice. I also have actually four blocks here, but I can only see three of them. So this happens to have two blocks that are coexisting um, in the same space. 
So in Rhino, if you have two forms that are coexisting close to each other and you click on one, it will probably get, start to give you this menu of things that you may want to choose. And if we want to just kind of push this point even more, maybe I could stick this here and then Now it's giving me the option to choose all three, right? So this, in some ways, is like a selection preview menu. Um, so if you want to uh, sort of be more precise about how you select objects, then you can choose one of these. You can also click none if you decided that maybe you did something wrong by clicking to select. OK? So um, another quick, quick kind of boring thing is um, we still have these two objects here. So probably I'm just going to take this one and move it over here. Now, you can see a couple of things are happening. You may have noticed as I'm kind of moving things around up here. Um, one thing is that we are really uh, in a situation where as I cut and paste these objects, Apparently, I've been cutting, cutting and pasting several times. Um, check that out. That looks really, really kind of nice, right? Like, it's just putting it in exactly the right spot. Why is that? Well, it's for two reasons. One reason is that I drew the shape to actually align with the grid. Um, in general, I think that uh, using the grid in Rhino is one, like, that's a tool for success. If you want things to work out in Rhino, use the grid. Um, because when you use the grid, you can do things like snap to the grid. And so right now, up here, I have grid snap enabled. Um, if I take grid snap off and I click and drag this, you can see that um, it's kind of a little bit more nebulous, like where it's going to go. And it doesn't, really, it doesn't really want to sort of like fit perfectly on there. What happens if I just eyeball it and do that? Well, oh, that looks fine, right? I mean, how could that be wrong? Very easily in Rhino. Um, in Rhino, if you don't snap things, you're pretty much always going to be wrong. Um, <laughs> I know that sounds really like dire and disappointing. Um, and again, it depends on like whether you need it to be perfectly aligned with that thing or not, right? Um, in some cases, like, especially if you're doing any kind of um, like object design, you would want it to be right on there. Um, but as you can see, when we move in quite a bit, it's really quite a bit off. So the other thing that can get kind of messed up in this process, if you don't use uh, any kind of snapping, is that you can uh, get into a situation where maybe you do something like that, and I'm just kind of playing around right now. And then you try to maybe join these two objects. And Rhino will come back to you by saying, I can't join these objects because they're not touching, right? Um, but then you can come back and be like, but they're touching. Of course, they're obviously touching. Rhino, what's your problem? Um, <laughs> and uh, that part of that is just sort of the, like, uh, cost of doing business with vectors. Um, what you're looking for is really like a very precise mathematical point. And so in Rhino, um, in general, I think it's better to have grid snap on. And then there's this second category. So if I go ahead and now try to snap this, it'll just snap like automatically. I can pull it maybe back here a little bit. And then uh, basically like snap it in now. And now it's pretty much there. Of course, not so much on the edge here, the side edge. So we'll, we'll revisit this later with a different tool. There's another uh, tool that you can use to deal with this. So am I making things more complicated than they need to be? Um, that's a fair criticism, but not really, actually. Um, <laughs> because in Rhino, um, this idea of whether things are touching or not is kind of a big deal. Um, because a, a lot of uh, artists, when they're working in Rhino, what they're doing, trying to do is they're trying to join things and trying to combine shapes to make other shapes. That's one of the main ways that you design thing in, things in Rhino. Um, and if they're not usually sort of touching in the right way, it can be a big deal. 
So we're not going to spend too much time thinking about that, though, because uh, the sort of simple answer would be to just use GridSnap, and then you sort of always have success, right? Um, now, there are situations where you may not be able to use GridSnap, and uh, those situations would be something like maybe, well, like if you're using a more complicated shape, like maybe this torus. So I'm just going to go ahead and make a nice fat torus here. Um, and you can see how, as I work, I'm kind of like uh, moving through different viewports just to sort of see what's there. Um, so yeah, so let's pretend that I want to take one of these boxes and I want to make it touch this uh, torus. Well, I can do it like that, and then I wind up with a little intersection. That's less than awesome. Um, I can also uh, potentially uh, use what's called the move tool. And the move tool, it's down here. Um, the move tool is really like, I probably do 90% of my moving with the actual move tool. Because it goes beyond this like clicking and dragging situation, um, where when you click and drag in Rhino, you don't really have like a whole lot of control over where you're sort of see how it defines a point that you're clicking from. You kind of don't really have full control of that, um, and that can be pretty annoying. So when you use the move tool, you can actually take a point and move it to another point. Um, let me do that again. So select objects to move. Yes. Yes. And then bam, right on there. So now, you know, okay, that curvy object is touching that sharp object. It doesn't really matter, you know, that it's curvy or not. But um, you uh, might notice that it popped up with that little knot thing. So if I do it just one more time. So point to move from, I want to move from this end point and then it'll come up with uh, whatever point is available, actually, on this shape. So there's a bunch of things to choose from. As you sort of hover around the shape, uh, options will present themselves to you. Like, I could move this dead to the, to the dead center of the torus, or um, to this point, or uh, perpendicular to this sort of quad right here. Um, so, so those are sort of some ways to deal with what's called the object snap. Um, and the object snap, you'll find the object snap, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of this torus, and we can just talk about it in the context of these blocks. Um, your object snap is down here. And so right now, I actually, if you look at the way that these uh, boxes are checked, that is sort of like my go-to sort of starting set of things that I may want to snap to. Now, I will probably talk about the snaps ad nauseum um, over the next couple weeks because you really ha kind of have to use them in order to do what you're doing in Rhino. So there are lots of times where I would change the configuration of these snaps, or uh, I would even maybe disable the snaps altogether, which down here you can disable them. Um, why would I disable them? Well, if I disable grid snap and object snap, I can kind of go on pure eyeball. <laughs> if you actually want to move something around and not have it um, sort of constrained by what's already there on the, on the screen, you can see it's not sort of attaching itself to anything. If I re-enable the object snap, um, I'm going to go ahead and just take off all of these options except for one. OK, so right now, I have this shape. Basically, uh, I have only object snap enabled. I have the end point enabled here. I don't have grid snap enabled. Um, so if I take this and click and drag it, I'll get the same function that I did before. If I use the move tool, I can snap to the end point, and I can attach it to another end point. Wow. I know, it's kind of like fine, maybe finer details, but uh, it does matter a lot. OK, so now, that being said, let's go ahead and like build something. Um, I think I'm ready. 
OK, so we've got sort of like three things here. I could certainly add uh, one more. So I would use the Move tool in this case. And I can just move this right there. Oh, it's perfectly snapped and everything. Um, I think I'll go ahead and get rid of this. And basically, what we're trying to do, um, it says in the uh, assignment that you have uh, the task of creating sort of 100 things, right? So here we have four things, which would be like a good starting point. Um, I can create 100 things super quickly by, uh, well, I can cut and paste these. Um, and so, as I said before, it pastes in the same spot. So we're going to want to sort of spend our first point bringing it up. And then maybe we could just start to you know, form a little tower. So there's a copy here. I'm going to do copy paste. And there's another tower. So that's great. Um, I feel like I could probably, like, just to make it a little more interesting, um, I could get rid of some of these. So it's like a little more like a broken, a broken thing. And we'll get rid of these guys too. Okay, so now I could actually count this and make it kind of its own module. Um, nobody is going to be counting your project, by the way. We just sort of want to look at it and see like a certain critical mass <laughs> of stuff. Um, but uh, don't let that 100 uh, number be daunting to you at all, because you can probably do it in you know less than eight keystrokes, um, depending on you know how you decide to sort of cut and paste stuff. So here I've got two, two, one, plus three. That is eight. OK, so I've got a module of eight. So I could take this and I could cut and paste it um, if I wanted to. And then there's my second module. Um, I could also take one of these modules and I could use the group function. So the group function is over here in uh, the tool toolbar, group objects. And by grouping the objects, um, a couple of things will happen. They'll select together. Um, some uh, functions up in this stuff will apply to all of them together. You can move them together, um, whereas here, obviously, we can only select and move one at a time. Um, and what else? Um, you can also you know, rotate and do all of the sort of tools to, uh, on them together. So let's go ahead and so we've got eight. So. Um, I actually want to go ahead and work with this group um, instead. So I'm going to group both of these. Um, fun trick in Rhino, actually. Let me undo that group. Um, so here we've got a, a sort of series of shapes, right? Um, check out if I draw my mouse cursor this way. OK, see how it caught all of them? And then if I draw my Mars cursor this way, it only selects what's completely within the window. Um, so that can be like, it took me years to figure that out <laughs> um, in Rhino, but it's, it's definitely a good trick. Um, so nonetheless, I'll go ahead and group this and then maybe cut and paste this a few times. Now, I'm doing a lot of cut, cutting and pasting, and that is kind of like, it smells a tiny bit like work. Um, you know, it's like a lot of like individually dealing with stuff and keystrokes and things like that. Um, what if we could take one of these forms and just copy it like anywhere we wanted? Oh, check it out. There's a copy tool um, in Rhino. It is right here. And you basically choose a point to copy from. And then you can copy any number of iterations of the same thing anywhere you like. Um, 
even on you know, other planes if you want. OK. So there is some stuff. So I th I'm going to sort of like trust that at this point we probably have like close to 100 objects. Um, should I be like maybe doing something with this? Um, yeah, probably. Um, I think these modules are a little bit like not exactly what I would hope for, but um, I think we can definitely come up with something. So I'm just kind of having an artistic moment here where I'm like, oh, what am I gonna, what am I gonna make out of this stuff? Um, that's a pretty, <laughs> pretty common, common feeling if you uh, are working with uh, creativity. Um, they're sort of like totem-like, like they're kind of, you know, up and down structures mostly. But I feel like maybe taking them in an abstract direction makes the most sense, other than trying to like, you know, kind of make something that looks like something. So probably what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to maybe group, group these further or organize them a little bit before I get started. So I'm going to take four of these forms and put them over there. I'll take four and put them over here. And this is the kind of moving that you can do without snaps or without sort of like thinking about it um, because it doesn't really matter um, if you know, these shapes, I'm, I'm just moving them temporarily to sort of organize them. And so this is a great sort of point to like use that sort of click and drag capability. So I think what I'm going to do with these shapes is I'm going to scale them uh, quite a bit. Um, so scaling in Rhino can be a little bit confusing. Um, so we'll take some time to like really kind of look at scaling. So with scaling, I'm going to go ahead and just start on one of these shapes. And uh, by the way, uh, sort of a saving tool, if you ever find yourself in a situation where that happens, um, did everyone just see what happened? Like, I basically just moved the, the grid um, out of the out of the lens of the camera for the perspective view. It's gone, like I have no idea where it is and I'm just like kind of panning through the space and I can't get it back. That's like a pretty common thing that happens. Maybe your cat walked on your laptop or something. So how do you get it back? Well, um, you have the object selected here, right? So this uh, view with the little um, yellow stuff in it called zoom selected um, first, you have to activate the viewport that you want to do that in, and then it will come up with the object, and it will also zero the rotation on that object. Um, so that's like a super important kind of like get out of jail free card <laughs> um, that I have, you know, obviously used a thousand times. So, okay, so we're going to go ahead and scale this object. Um, and with scaling the object, uh, a couple of things come to mind. Um, First of all, I'll show you the scale tool down here. Um, well, we have scale 3D, scale 2D, scale 1D, non-uniform scale, and scale by plane. We will probably cover all the first four of these things at some point. But for now, I'm going to assume that you just want to, like, you're like, OK, I have this thing. It's a 3D thing. I want to make it bigger or smaller, right? That is scale 3D. <laughs> so we'll talk about all the other reasons why you may need to do one of the other scales probably as we go along in the class. OK, so when you activate the scale 3D, it asks you to come up with a base point. Um, usually, I choose a corner for this kind of stuff. Um, and then it asks you to come up with a scale factor. So in this sort of scale factor choosing, um, you could certainly come up with, uh, and actually, I'm going to choose another start point because I just noticed that I choose, chose this elevated point. So let me do that one more time. So I'm going to choose the front, actually, because the front has a bottom point. It doesn't really matter. I'm just being kind of picky. So I'm going to choose that point. And then for a scale reference, what it's basically asking you when it asks you for a scale reference, which is kind of vague and you know 
maybe people don't un like understand what that is immediately. It's asking you, what is one? In other words, how big is it now? Um, and so what you generally want to do for that part of the function is to sort of encompass the scale in at least one dimension of the object. So in other words, we're just going from corner to corner or from edge to edge, OK? And then that reference point becomes what you use to scale it up or down. And you can see that um, in this case, we're using the top view to scale it, but obviously it's scaling in three dimensions. So I think I'll take it down by about that much. And also, at some point, I must have flipped the grid here, which is kind of classic. Um, and then there's that. It is scaled. Behold. So another fun thing to do is that you can use the scale function on many things at once. So I'm going to undo what we just did. And I'm going to say, all right, I would like to scale these four things. Um, I'll go to my perspective window and do that zoom selected thing just so I can see them. And I want to go ahead and scale them all pretty much the way, exactly the same way that I just did. So I'll click the Scale 3D button. And then from here, I can still sort of scale one, and it should scale them all. So I can basically do that. And it just kind of, because they're all in the same proportion and same sort of space, they're going to inherit that scaling from you know, just picking that one object. So there is some of that. Um, Scale 2D and Scale 1D, I actually don't want to do those right now um, because we have these uh, things that are of a certain proportion. Like you may notice, they're actual cubes. Um, if I were to apply Scale 2D or Scale 1D, they would basically like turn them into long rectangles or something like that. And that doesn't just seem good for like the task at hand right now. Um, I think I'll take these and make these uh, scale down a little bit more as well. Um, and just to show you, you know, it's kind of, it's pretty forgiving, um, the whole scaling process. Like I could scale, oh, except that's the wrong tool, scale um, all four of these. And if I wanted to be much looser about the process, I could just select any base point, select any point on the 2D plane, and then I could do what's called eyeballing it. <laughs> um, you know, is this better uh, or worse? Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, it depends on if you want them to sort of like lock into each other or, you know, interact with each other, I guess. Um, but that also sort of works. Um, and then maybe let's take a look at yet another sort of approach. Um, in this case, we could certainly uh, just use literally any, any point on the grid. Um, this works better when these are aligned to the grid. Actually, I think I'll just use one of these little ones. And you can see it sort of scales towards whatever you form as the base point. So you can sort of scale and move at the same time, which is even more fun. So, OK, so that's pretty much scaling. And I think now we have some, like, we probably will not finish this uh, today. But um, basically what we're getting to is sort of this idea that we can now take these things and sort of come up with maybe some pairings. Um, and if you want to see where I'm looking right now, that's over here. Maybe I'll do that zoom selected thing again. Um, so now we just have this like little pairing. And I kind of feel like some of these need to be even smaller. Um, so 
I will go ahead and do that. Um, kind of like that the best. And so then these can be sort of added into this world. I'm just kind of cramming them wherever they sort of seem to want to go. Um, you know, there's no sort of like plan or precise um, sort of plan here. I will move them into the area where they're actually visible. So there's that guy. So anyway, we're starting to kind of get somewhere um, with this. We're sort of like halfway to a project, I feel like. Um, now, what else can we do? I guess that would be a, a, you know, another question. Well, let me show you just a couple more tools um, that might help be helpful. So if I wanted to, like, let's say, take this larger shape and rotate it, um, you could use the Rotate tool. So we are rotating in 3D, so you just click the button. And you have to click a center of rotation. If that's the center of your object, then yay. Uh, if it's not, that's perfectly reasonable choice also. Um, but you basically click one sort of reference point, just like we did with scaling. And then you go ahead and uh, spin to your heart's content. Um, now, you can see that right now we don't have any sort of like constraint on our rotation. Um, and also, by the way, these modes up at the top, right now we're only in planar mode, um, which is something that I use like 90% of the time. The other thing that you can activate is something called ortho mode, which can be really useful for even this assignment. Um, so if you have ortho mode on and you go to rotate this thing, you're going to have a slightly different experience. Um, it's going to it's going to constrain itself to right angles. Um, and uh, that's basically what ortho does. It constrains everything to right angles. So uh, when you move something, it's only going to move it up or down. It won't move it diagonally. Um, and that's just a tool for you know, using things that are sort of aligned on certain axes, right? Um, which you know, I've heard a lot of objects uh, and environments also uh, tend to follow this thing called the Cartesian plane. So, so that's pretty much what that is for. OK, so we're running out of time today. But basically, um, you, what we're looking for you to do for the assignment is to you know, make something like that uh, or potentially just you know, glom some shapes together. Um, it can be any shape from this menu. And uh, go ahead and just turn in um, the, uh, the 3DM file. And uh, we are not asking for any sort of screenshots or renderings or anything like that. Um, so again, this is just kind of a way to like, get your feet wet with Rhino and kind of go through some of the basic functions of moving, scaling, rotating, making you know, groupings, and things like that. All right, I will see you on Tuesday. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for coming.